I'll have you turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and our text today will be verses 4 through 7. I'll ask you to stand if you're able. If not, that's all right, but you can follow along as I read. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, and by the Holy Spirit says, verse 4, For we know brothers and sisters loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You, verse 6, became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Let's pray, if you would join with me. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we're here today in this beautiful church building that you gave us, because we're hungry and we're thirsty And we know that only you can satiate that hunger and that thirst that we have. So Lord, it's with great anticipation that we look to you to speak into our lives, in and through your word. And Lord, as you do, we want to have ears to hear and hearts to receive. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I made the decision to only take and tackle these four verses today, because to me, the text before us answers a very important question concerning the trials that we face in our lives as Christians. And it's the question of how it's actually possible to truly have joy in the midst of not just suffering, but severe suffering. (laughs) I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we would have to readily admit that this notion of having joy in the midst of severe suffering seems unrealistic, unattainable, unreachable. I mean, truth be known, we're just trying to get through the severe suffering, to say nothing of having joy in the midst of it. It's striking to me that Paul would mention this about these Christians there in Thessalonica, because at this time, at the time that he wrote this letter, this church in particular was being persecuted severely, if I can use that word again. They were being persecuted by Rome, and they were being persecuted by the Jews. And here Paul writes to them in what many believe is the first letter he ever wrote. And he's making mention of their joy in severe suffering. Now, if you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, you want to know what it was about these believers that enabled them to actually 
experience such joy in the midst of such suffering. Wouldn't you want to know what their secret was? How it is that they were able to experience this joy in the midst of that suffering? Well, I would suggest that there are two reasons. And the first is because of the Holy Spirit, specifically the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and also the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice two times, first in verse 5, and then again in verse 6, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, he says, the gospel came to them, not simply with words, but also by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 6, he says that the joy they had in the midst of the severe suffering was given to them by the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? Well, I hope that this doesn't sound like a firm grasp of the obvious, but he's saying that it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there needs to be a distinction between the two in this sense. Fruit grows over time. A gift is something that is received instantly. And I would submit that what the Apostle Paul is saying to them is that they had both. And that's why they were able to have this joy in the midst of severe suffering. It was because of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it was because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, both. Listen to what James says in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. A verse, a passage, a promise really familiar, I'm sure, to most. He says, verse 2, consider it pure joy, pure joy, (laughs) my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And here's why, and here's how. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Produces. Is that not what we call fruit? Produce? It produces fruit. In other words, the trial produces that which you need to persevere in the trial. It's produced in the trial. I hope you got that, because that's as good as it gets, as good as I can possibly say it. So (coughs) the testing of your faith in that trial is what produces perseverance. And then he says this in verse 4, and it can be easily missed at first read. He says, key word, let, let perseverance finish its work. That's the problem. We don't let it, we fight it. Let. And that word, that three-letter word, implies in and of itself that the onus is on us to let perseverance, the work that God is doing in and through that trial, finish. Let perseverance finish. Let it finish its work. Sometimes I think we unnecessarily, (laughs) to our own peril, prolong the trial, because we don't let God do what He wants to do in and through that trial. We are kicking and fighting 
and biting and scratching and complaining. Pastors say lamenting. We don't use the word complaining. It sounds more spiritual. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let the Word of God, let the work of God, let God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, do that work in you, in and through whatever it is you're going through. This ties into the second way that it's actually possible, achievable, obtainable to have joy in the midst of severe suffering. And it's what I'll call the openness of brokenness. Allow me to explain what I mean by this. Notice in verse 6 that Paul says they welcomed the message. That's the key word to me. They welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. But they welcomed it. Why? Because of the brokenness. Again, the key word here is they welcomed it such that they were open to it and welcoming of it. Now here's the question. What made them so open, so welcoming? The answer is the brokenness of severe suffering. I was thinking about this this last week. There are seven letters to seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. And the second church is the church of Smyrna. And every single one of those seven literal churches that were at that time in Asia Minor, we know it today as modern day Turkey, that's in the news a lot today. These were actual literal churches. And this second church, that Jesus has John write a letter to, and have it sent to, is the church of Smyrna. It's known affectionately as the persecuted church. It is one of only two of the seven churches for which there is no rebuke, like there were for the other churches. The other church is the church of Philadelphia. They're actually commended, encouraged, For the Church of Philadelphia, it's, I know you have little strength. I know you're just hanging on. Hold on. I'm coming soon. Just hang in there. You've you've kept my word. You've not denied my name. I know you're weary. Hang on. I'm coming. To the Church of Smyrna, again, the only other of the seven churches, along with Philadelphia, that there's no rebuke. This was a persecuted church, and the name is the nature, as is the case with all seven of the churches. The Church of Philadelphia, Philia, the church of brotherly love. Laodicea is an interesting uh, one. The name is truly the nature. It's a combination of two words, Laodicea, where we get our English words, laity and diocese. In other words, the laity rule. That's why Jesus is on the outside of that church, knocking on the door, asking to come back in, to sup with them and them with him. Huge rebuke. This lukewarm church, he goes as far as saying, I I wish you were either hot or cold. Because you are lukewarm, I want to vomit you up out of my mouth. You make me sick. That's the idea in the original of what Jesus is saying to that lukewarm last days Laodicean church. The church of Smyrna, the name is the nature. It's the name of a bitter herb known as myrrh. This was a church 
that was suffering bitter persecution. But what's interesting about the herb myrrh is that it is bitter until it is crushed and broken. And when it's broken, it releases a marvelous and wonderful aroma and fragrance. But it has to be crushed. And this is what I believe the Apostle Paul is drawing attention to, their openness, their willingness. The reason why they had this joy, this true joy, this, as James would say, pure joy, is because of their brokenness. You know, we don't want to be broken. Isn't it true that everything within our human nature, our sin nature, everything within our flesh chafes at the idea of being broken? Is it not true that we devalue broken things? We throw away broken things? But when I read the Scriptures, I find that there is a beautiful fragrance in brokenness. I find in the Scriptures that there is always a blessing that comes because of the brokenness. It wasn't until Jacob was broken that Jacob was blessed. He wrestled with the Lord all night, demanding that he be blessed, to which the Lord would say, I can't bless you until I break you. The breaking always precedes the blessing. That's just how it works. And God values brokenness. What if I told you that that trial you're in, that difficulty that you're experiencing, may be for the sole purpose of God breaking the hardness of the soil of your heart, to make it supple, fertile, so that you're open to receive the seed of His Word to you? Isn't it true that it's only in brokenness, in suffering, in trials, in difficulty, that we're open to what God is wanting to get our attention? To tell us and to show us? Conversely, when things are going well, uh, He doesn't have our attention. When things are going well in my life, I don't really grow. It's when things are hard in my life, and there's a breaking in my life, and there's suffering and pain and difficulty and trials in my life. That's when I grow. And that's when the soil, the hardened soil of my heart is broken and made supple and made fertile. And now God's Word, God's work is able to germinate and sprout and bear fruit, love, joy, goodness, meekness, patience, kindness, self-control, the fruit. And it's also when I'm broken that I'm able to experience the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. I was thinking about the Israelites and after the exodus out of Egypt, and there they are at the Red Sea, and the Egyptians are behind them. 
the Red Sea in front of them. And this is how it looks like it's going to end. In fact, they even turn on Moses and start murmuring. That was just the beginning. <laughs> Were there not enough graves in Egypt? God had to bring us here to kill us. And I was thinking about how that they would have never experienced the power of God had they not been led to the Red Sea. What I'm saying is, how is it possible for us to experience the goodness of God, the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the victory, the miracle, unless there's first the need for it. You know, when God had Adam name all the animals, which is a marvel unto itself, you got to wonder when like a giraffe came up and he just, what did, what did he do? Giraffe? I mean, I don't know. Of course, it wasn't in the English language, so. But it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that before he created Eve, he had Adam name the animals in pairs, male and female. Why? Here's what I think. I think that God was showing Adam his need before he met his need. So here's Adam going, hmm, I see a pattern here. They all have a mate, and I don't. And so before God met his need, because it's not good for man to be alone. Come on, guys. Amen. Right? I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> it is not good for man to be alone. I will make for him a helpmeet. So he shows Adam his need, and then he meets his need. And that's what God does in our lives. We need him. Our problem, we don't know that we need him. So how's God going to meet a need that we don't know we need. He's going to show us, you need me. How's He going to do that? Oh, adversity strikes. Trials come. Life happens. Problems hit. And then it breaks the hardness so that now God has the openness from that brokenness with which to do that which He has desired to do all along. And it's the very thing that we need. Listen to what the prophet Hosea in chapter 10 verse 12 said. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness on you. In other words, your hearts are hard. Unbrokenness. God can't do anything. How can God do anything in your life if there's a hardness there? A.W. Tozier. I have a love-hate relationship with his writing. Oh, some of you do too, it sounds like. I mean, I, I love Tozier because, I mean, he just says it like it is. He pulls no punches. But I also hate Tozier because he says it like it is, and he pulls no punches. <laughs> and you walk away, you know, from... Like Oswald Chambers is kind of like that too. Tozier more so, though. I mean, he's just in your face. And then afterwards, you're, you walk away, you're like, I remember when I was, 
in my devotions, I was going through uh, A.W. Tozer, and I could only handle it for about two months. <laughs> uh, after about two months, I started questioning my own salvation, certainly my sanctification. <laughs> but there was an appreciation, because it's true. It's true. I want to share with you what is perhaps the most powerful writing from Tozer, one that God has used in my life in a powerful way. It's in his series, Trials and Pain, and he titles this particular devotional, The Sharp Blade of the Plow. He says, the fallow field, the hard field, is smug, contented, protected from the shock of the plow and the agitation of the harrow. But it is paying a terrible price for its tranquility. Never does it see the miracle of growth. Never does it feel the motions of mounting life, nor see the wonders of bursting seed, nor the beauty of ripening grain. Fruit it can never know, because it is afraid of the plow and the harrow. In direct opposite to this, the cultivated field has yielded itself to the adventure of living. The protecting fence has opened to admit the plow, and the plow has come, as plows always come. Practical, cruel, businesslike, and in a hurry. <laughs> Peace has been shattered by the shouting farmer and the rattle of machinery. The field has felt the travail of change. It has been upset, turned over, bruised, and broken. But its rewards come hard upon its labors. The seed shoots up into the daylight, its miracle of life, curious, exploring the new world above it. All over the field, the hand of God is at work in the age-old and ever-renewed service of creation. New things are born to grow, mature, and consummate the grand prophecy latent in the seed when it entered the ground. Nature's wonders follow the plow. Let it. Stop fighting it. Let God do what He desires to do, as painful as it might be, as cruel as it might seem, as hard as it might become. I want to close with a question. You see it there on the screen. Think this through and allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart concerning this. What is that trial producing in your life? What is the severe suffering producing in your life? What is God doing in and through that hardship, that difficulty, that trial? that He has allowed into your life. He's allowed it into your life for a reason. He has a purpose. He wants to produce something. I keep a prayer journal, and I, this is a number of weeks ago now, had an entry that at first I thought, I had been thinking about it. God had been ministering to me concerning the trials in my life, the, the struggles, the difficulties, the suffering. And 
I found myself in the quietness of my heart, which is what I ended up entering into my prayer journal as a prayer of thanksgiving. I found myself thanking God for the severity of the suffering. And I thanked Him because of what, not, not for the suffering, <laughs> but for what He was producing in my life by way of the suffering. The work He was doing in me. Because the purpose is this, and it's in the verse after that verse we love so much, Romans 8, 28. The purpose is to make us more like Jesus. That's why He allows the trials, the difficulty, the pain, the suffering, the hardship. He works it out for the good. But our problem is, and I know we talked about this a little bit last week, I won't go into it uh, too much today, but I think that our definition of good needs to be revisited. The good that is being produced in my life from the suffering are all of the things <laughs> that make me more like Jesus. I'm more loving. I'm more humble. I'm certainly much kinder and have so much more compassion for people because of the suffering. It's also produced in me patience. That's a biggie. You know, it's like that saying, I'm sure you've heard it, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. Does it work like that? How am I going to learn to be patient? Oh, by going through a trial. Patiently enduring that difficulty. The patience to endure the trial comes by patiently enduring the trial, because the trial produces the patience and the endurance and the perseverance. What is that trial? What is that difficulty? What is that hardship producing in your life? Let's pray. Father, thank you. <sighs> Lord, we do thank you. We do thank you for the difficulties and the hardship and the trials that you've allowed into our lives because of what you're producing in us, the work that you're doing in us because of it. Lord, we want to be more like Jesus. We want to be more like you, Lord. And if this is the way that it has to be, and the only way that you can do that, then Lord, so be it. We surrender to you. And in so doing, Lord, would you give us by the Holy Spirit that joy that you gave to the Thessalonians in the midst of severe suffering? Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.